This video is just one small part of a video where I compared anastrozole, exemestane, and letrozole. If you're interested in seeing those head-to-head -head comparisons, I'll link that at the end of the video. But before we get into this one, this is not medical advice. This should not be used to treat or diagnose medical conditions. This is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Let's get into this. Anastrozole is probably the most widely used medication in a TRT context. Today's Monday when I'm filming this, I guarantee you hundreds of thousands of milligrams of anastrozole were taken by dudes today to manage high E2 symptoms. But what does the literature say? We're going to talk about that first, then I'll get into our experience at Steel Health and Hormone Center and how this actually works with our patients. But this study kind of stood out to me. I thought it was pretty good. It's titled The Utilization and Impact of Aromatase Inhibitor Therapy in Men with Elevated Estradiol Levels on Testosterone Therapy. So the methods, all patients on testosterone therapy at a high volume sexual medicine practice, <laughs> we just call it an HRT clinic, uh, but sexual medicine practice works too, between 2005 and 2019 were reviewed. Men with E2 levels above 60 picograms per milliliter regardless of symptoms, or 40 to 60 picograms per milliliter with subjective symptoms, were started on anastrozole 0.5 milligrams three times per week. That's why it's important to have a conversation with your provider, because if you're symptomatic, we're gonna corroborate that with blood work, or your provider should corroborate that with blood work and then find a way to manage estrogen. And anastrozole is one of the ways that we do it here. That's what this study did too. What are the results? Testosterone therapy distribution between groups was different with greater rates of topical testosterone therapy in the lack of anastrozole groups and greater rates of intramuscular testosterone therapy in the anastrozole treated groups. That is true. What I, I also see that. Okay, so guys that are on a cream, they generally have less estradiol symptoms and less estradiol in their serum than dudes that are doing injections. But I think there are ways to kind of combat that. When you're on a cream, you're doing it every single day. When you're doing an injection, you should be doing it several times per week, especially if you can do it subcutaneously. Um, and that does seem to alleviate kind of this disparity between the two. We have a video on that, check out the channel. But what did the results actually say? Of the 44 men treated with anastrozole, 68% had pre-E2 levels greater than 60, 32% had levels between 40 and 60. Median pre-anastrozole E2 levels were 65 in comparison to 22 post-anastrozole E2 levels. So at 0.5 milligrams, three times per week, you brought the, the median from 65 to 22, so you literally cut it by two thirds on just 0.5 milligrams three times per week. How do I feel about this? 22, honestly, I mean, it depends on the level of testosterone too. It does seem on the lower end, but for some clinics, 22 is totally normal. And that's obviously what these, uh, what these researchers found to, to be helpful. We notice in our clinic is anastrozole is our go-to, okay? If somebody is symptomatic with high E2 levels, they're starting to get nipple sensitivity, maybe some mood changes, maybe some libido issues, we corroborate that with blood work, and then we will treat that high E2. Now, anastrozole is part of the estrogen management plan, but that is not a standalone. We do other things like changing the dosing protocol, maybe changing the method of administration, but, and astrozole is our go-to. The only exception being is, let's say somebody has high E2 symptoms, but their estradiol is actually like relatively low. There could be something else going on. We're gonna get a prolactin test. Maybe we're also gonna use a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator like raloxifene, but that's not here nor there. We use an astrozole. It does seem to be extremely well tolerated. We haven't had any issues with it. Um, there are some risks associated with it, which we're gonna get into in the head-to-head -head comparison, but just understand that anastrozole is a non-steroidal, non-suicidal aromatase inhibitor. It also is well studied and it's what we use here. Just to briefly touch on this, the fear with these non-steroidal, non-suicidal aromatase inhibitors is that you're gonna have this huge rebound effect when you come off of this medication and all of a sudden your estradiol is gonna shoot through the roof. Does that happen? No, I'll be honest with you, we don't see that because anastrozole is just part of a treatment plan of managing estradiol. And even for guys that like, I own a gym too, not just this HRT clinic, dudes that blast gear, like blast, blast, 
five, six, seven hundred milligrams of testosterone, and they use estro they use an aromatase inhibitor like an astrozole. They use it while they're blasting that gear, and then they use it for a little bit after the fact. And then once their testosterone, they go on a cruise or they come off medication, they use that anastrozole until things kind of balance and then they come off. So your androgens are lower, right? And so in a TRT context, if you have super high androgens and super high estradiol, you can use this aromatase inhibitor, bring down the androgens a little bit, and then everything starts to come down. So maybe if you went from blasting a ton of testosterone in a steroid context and you were using an astrozole, then all of a sudden came off, maybe you would have this massive rebound effect. But generally speaking, in a TRT context and even in a cycling context, Nah, I think it's a fear that may be founded in certain circumstances, but in most circumstances, not founded. Now that we understand anastrozole, let's look at something that you may never have heard of. It's called XMS stain. We're gonna talk about that right now.